I never felt anything like it before. I'm like, I'm, I'm in my own. I think you know who I am. The Nicaraguan people we met hated the contrast for all the pain and suffering that they had caused him. And since there's no hot water, that he had to boil some. I'm so 23, and now I've decided to enlist in the United States Army. And we stay here, he's not going to make it. People make it vital. God ain't made no food here. Yeah. This is a strong black woman. So then, for a hell of a fight. I believe I was in high school. I was walking home from football practice after school with a couple of my friends. All of a sudden, a police officer pulled over, hopped out of his car and told us not to move. And I guess I was walking too fast for the police officers and they tried to look in my bags. At first, I kind of denied them because I know my rights. Eventually, I just gave in and I let them look in my bags and they realized it was just closed. And the man was following me around the store like I was gonna steal something, even though I had the money on me. And he said the thing that they always say that um, something happened a couple of blocks ago, and you fit the description of the person that was seen fleeing the seat, fleeing the scene of the crime. So I guess when the call came in, my like dad had fit the description, but like. He was not the person who did it, so they actually like beat him real bad, like real bad. He had to get stitches in his head. Racial profiling refers to the targeting individual for suspicion of crime based on the individual's race, ethnicity, or religion. Even though it is illegal, racial profiling still goes on to this day. As of 2019, young black and Latino males between ages of 14 and 24 made up only 5% of New York City's population, but 38% of reported stops. I was 13 years old at the time, so I was like really young. And I was coming back from my grandmother's house, and she gave me like $20. So I put the, the $20 in my socks, right? Where I live at is the South Bronx, Patterson Projects. So I was trying to look for a friend that Saturday morning. So I went to the first building, went to the 12th floor, knocked on his door. When I came back down, I noticed like two cops, There's always cops around here. Like I kind of had butterflies in my stomach. Like I was walking down the block and he was following me. Thinking of mind, let me just hit the corner and run home. So I hit around the corner, boom, the cops was there. I thought about running again, but I was like, nah, let me just walk and act like I'm minding my business. Anyway, the cops stopped me, right? So I was like nervous. I was like shaking a little bit because most of the time the cops interact with somebody I know, like a friend of mine or like my brother or like an older head around the block and comes to like interrogation. And it was like, why do you have a hoodie on? I'm like, I don't, like it's cold outside. I, I have a hoodie on. They was patting me down. And then once they touched my leg, they was like, why are you shaking? I'm like, no reason. They found $20. And it was like, what is this? I'm like, it's $20. The only thing that was on my mind was like, I hope I don't get shot or I hope I don't get the $20 taken away from me because I'm hungry. Yeah, I felt kind of tough that day, you know, because I got stopped by the cops like everybody else. My brother and I, we were arrested and the police beat us pretty bad, pretty badly when we were children. I was, I was 15 at the time. And for no reason at all, they just stopped and said, you feel like a beat down. And the two officers were, that were involved, they took us downstairs in the 103rd precinct, the same precinct that Sean Bell was killed in. And they just kicked us in our groin repeatedly. And a black officer came in the room and told them, that's enough. He did nothing else. All he said was, that's enough.
I stopped dressing a certain way. I stopped like walking a certain way. I feel like it was a loss of identity I had. I started doing research of like, why you can't wear hoodies and why like police stop black men. And I was just looking at mad posts about like police brutality. I seen Rodney King, I seen, yeah, Trayvon Martin. It comes to a point like doing all this research, I kind of got like scared of the world. The world seemed like a dark place. The history of America is deeply intertwined with the violence of racial oppression, where the first form of policing was slave patrols to chase down and apprehend or return runaway slaves to their owners. This organized group of Caucasian men enforced the pass system, which required slaves absent from their master's property to have a pass or ticket. One can help but make the connection between the pass system of the 1700s and today, when people of color are continuously stopped and questioned whenever they are outside of the neighborhoods in which they stereotypically reside. After the abolition of slavery were black codes, designed to target them for unjust arrests. Arrested convicts were then forced to work at private corporations. While police officers are no longer straddling horses and carrying whips and chains, they are still arresting people of color for unjust reasons. We need policemen like us, like from our community. How would it be like a suburban white male coming to the New York City? and definitely to the Bronx. You gonna obviously think some like, every black person is a monster because that's what you hear, you never experienced it. When creating our documentary, we decided to find out if the recruitment of cops of color could end racial profiling. In 1981, the U.S. Justice Department filed a lawsuit contending that the NYPD was discriminating against blacks, Hispanics, and women in its hiring and promotion of officers. As a result, Federal Judge Robert Carter assured the public that there would be more female, black, and Hispanic officers on the NYC police force. A young man named Randolph Evans was shot by a, a housing police officer for no reason at all. And a group of leaders in the African American community told us that we were making no headway in dealing with police abuse in our city and they wanted us all to go into a law enforcement agency and fight from within. It was traumatizing at first because you don't want to go into the belly of your abuser, but I found that it was therapeutic. By going into the police department, it helped me uh, take that demasculation that I felt when I was beaten that way, and it empowered me to fight in the police department, get promoted in that police department, and then be able to command those officers in that same police department. In 1988, 90% of the officers who ranked above captain were white. Today, it remains 79%, while 68% of NYC's population is not white. White cops also make up 45% of the police department, but get 80% of the executive promotions. As we diversify on this job, we have an increased level of bullying. I've had people who speak freely making slurs, you know, um, make all kind of racial slurs. The Civilian Complaint Review Board is an impartial agency that has been independent from the NYPD since 1993. CCRB investigates unlawful misconduct by the NYPD officers and makes data about complaints available to the public. The CCRB is a main line of defense against the police misconduct. The CCRB was instrumental in the firing of Daniel Plantaleo in 2019 for the killing of Eric Garner in 2014. How does the CCRB deal with complaints involving racism? Uh, as far as determining if the act was initiated by the police officer as a result of racism, that would be hard to determine. Do you believe that the police target um, minorities of color, mostly in the young area? I won't say that police actually, I don't, I don't think police actually target young minorities. I think that um, young people are at high risk because they have a lot of time. It was a fact that I read that it said that out of black and Latino young males of age 14 to 24 make 5% of the population in NYC but are 38% of the stops. So let me say this. So I will say from 2015 to 2016, right, there were 580,000 stop and frisk encounters. 96% of them taking place in black and Latino communities, 4% taking place in white communities. I don't think that it's right. I don't think that it's fair. In 2016, of the 175 cases in which the CCRB recommended an officer to be charged for misconduct, the NYPD only followed through on seven. For many years, the police department 
didn't want to acknowledge the problems of ro racial profiling. And so many of our officers that came out of the police department, they came out embracing the culture of when I police, I don't see race. That is a lot of crap. When you police, we see race in everything we do, but we need to, to have real conversations and the trainings need to impact and, and affect that. And then you see a gradual change in how we are treated, treating people that we police. If you are in a toxic system, you have a tendency to embrace the, uh, the toxic mindset of it. So do you have some black cops that don't like themselves and so they are just as abusive as white cops? Yes, you do. But the overwhelming number of black cops I have interacted with are clear that we need to be um, extremely uh, proactive and we need to be extremely steadfast in stopping abuse. On March 5th, 2016, 12 active duty officers of color first went public with claims of illegal racial quotas within the department in an I-Team interview. These NYPD officers are challenging what they call a racially charged policy of quotas for arrest and summonses. But whistleblowers can make a change from the inside of a system by exposing schemes that go against the book. As we were producing this documentary, several officers made sworn statements that they were told by commanders that while policing, the subway to target blacks and Latinos, and that's whites and Asians should be left alone. October 4th of 2018, I had got into altercation. A few months later, a detective came to my school. He told my principal for us to go to the um, precinct later on that day. I wasn't disrespectful to him at all. I sat there with the nicest attitude I could ever have, and he just kept yelling at me. I was scared. Honestly, dude, I felt like if I one thing would have slipped and it was disrespectful, he would have tried to lock me up right then and there. And ever since then, I guess being a cop was one of my passions. I feel like I wouldn't treat somebody like that, especially somebody that hasn't been in that situation before. If I bring somebody into an interrogation room, I'm going to ask them questions about their past, try to get to know them, connect with them. Not everybody's been a criminal their whole life. I'm not going to be like the cops, the way the cops is now in this generation. I'm going to change and try my hardest, make it one of my biggest goals to make a change in the community. I think change starts with us really taking control of how we want policing to be in our community. That's number one, going inside, or number two, starting your own organizations or entities uh, that will describe what policing should look like. I want the NYPD to know that I'm a civilized, caring individual and I try to never bring any harm to anybody around me. Definitely not in my community. I wouldn't want anything to happen to anybody in my community. One thing I want the NYPD to know about me is that I am not who they think I am because of these stereotypes. Like, I'm a positive person. I'm trying to do the right thing. We're all the same. I'm like you and you're like me and nobody's different.